Lorna, you, I think you said that The Wild and You was the first uh, book you had put out that was explicitly about the natural world all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you consider yourself an eco-poet? <laughs> Well, I think all my life I've been a poet that has used images from nature, and in a way, for a while, that was very uh, considered very outre, old-fashioned, uh, because we kept hearing that, well, the real poets are writing about the urban, hip, cool world, and suddenly now it's popular, and I'm an eco-poet, whereas <laughs> before I was a boring, you know, middle-aged nature poet, so I'll, I'll take any label, I guess, that, yes. that you want to give me. We've been called worse. We've both been called worse, probably. <laughs> yes, it's, oh, without, without a doubt. big supporter of the Toronto Public Library for decades and decades. And we've been doing these Star Talk events in this room since it opened, which was eight or nine years ago. And uh, we've got a lineup uh, coming this year, as Greg says, go to the website, take a look, or take a look at the star.com. I always have to talk about platforms now. When I got into business, it was just a print thing. Now there's platforms. We have an event next week in here. On Sunday, we're doing a Star Talks in Stratford. We do them every summer, uh, right on stage after uh, the plays. Uh, so if you get a chance to get to Stratford at some point later this year or next year, take a look for us. My role here tonight is to introduce Star Science and Technology reporter Kate Allen, who's going to be inter interviewing Jeff Vandermeer and Lorna Crozier. Let me tell you about, a bit about Kate. She writes about science and technology for the star. Her beat has taken her to the fossil-filled badlands of Alberta, a Japanese jellyfish research cruise. Don't know what that's about. And the artificial intelligence labs at Google in the inside of a dead blue whale right here in Toronto. She was part of the team at the star behind the Autism Project, a series that was nominated for the Michener Award, which in Canada is one of our most prestigious journalism awards. Before coming to the Science Beat in 2012, Kate covered news and features for the star. She has a Master's of Journalism degree from the University of British Columbia and a Bachelor's from the University of King's College. And next week, she's down at Woods Hole's Oceanographic Center to do more research for us. Jeff Vandermeer. Jeff told me it took him seven years to write Born. I can't believe it takes that long to write a book, but then he tells me he's writing on a number of books at the same time. They're all working in his head. He's been called one of the most remarkable practitioners of literary fantastic in America today. The New Yorker has named him the king of weird fiction. His best-selling Southern Reach trilogy has been translated into more than 35 languages. In his first novel, Annihilation, won the Nebula Award and the Shirley Jackson Award and was shortlisted for more than half a dozen more and it's been made into a movie, which will be released next year by Paramount. His latest novel, Born, the one that took so long to write, has also been optioned to Paramount, and it continues to explore themes related to the environment, animals, and our future. He frequently speaks across North America. He's actually been on tour since March or April, talking about issues related to climate change and storytelling. And his nonfiction has appeared in such newspapers as New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and many more, and hopefully in the Toronto Star. Lorna Crozier, she's an officer of the Order of Canada and is acknowledged, acknowledged for her contributions to Canadian literature, her teaching and mentoring with five honorary degrees most recently from McGill and Simon Fraser. Her books have received numerous national awards, including the Governor General's Award for Poetry. A professor Emerita at the University of Victoria 
She's performed for the Queen and has read her poetry on every conten continent except Antarctica. She, I think she's working on that one. Her latest book is What the Soul Doesn't Want. And last year, The Wrong Cat received a prestigious Pat Lowther Memorial Award for Best Book of Poetry. One of her fans said in a recent tweet, she, he described her as wonderful. That fan is Jeff Vandermeer. Please welcome the wonderful Lorna Crozier, Jeff Vandermeer, and Kate Allen. Thank you guys for coming um, from pretty far away. Actually, our Canadian is from <laughs> geographically <laughs> further away. Um, but thank you both for traveling here. Uh, so we're, we're here to discuss ecofiction and climate activism, but I thought I'd start with um, a question about place, because place tends to be very important, and places tend to be very important to people who care about the environment. And you two are both from very, very different environments. Um, Jeff, you, you were born in uh, the Fiji Islands, right? You grew up in the Fiji I Islands. I grew up in the Fiji Islands. Yeah. yeah. And Lorna, you grew up in Saskatchewan, which mm -hmm. is not very much like the Fiji Islands. No, it's as far away from <laughs> the not. ocean as you can possibly <laughs> imagine. So I'm interested in how those places influenced you as, as writers. Um, did it shape sort of who you are and what you write about? And uh, actually, maybe we'll, we'll start with Lorna. OK. Um, I've lived on Vancouver Island now for 25 years. Yeah, 1991, I moved there. Uh, but before that, I grew up in the uh, short grass prairie of southwest Saskatchewan, where um, there were no trees. Uh, my friends didn't believe me that when I told them that growing up in Swift Current, which is near the Alberta and the Montana border, that there was one wild tree. <laughs> and, and so when my friends and I would say, let's meet at the tree, um, <laughs> no one said, what tree? We, we all knew exactly where to go. And now I live in a rainforest just across the road from us is you know, five acres of second growth, tall fir and cedar. So they're two very different environments, and they both exert their pull on me. But I think, for me, what shapes me and shapes the images I use and the stories I want to tell in poetry is the landscape that formed my blood and my bones. And that, no doubt, is the prairies, um, the big sky. Uh, to, to be treeless sounds like a, a, a terrible thing, a deprivation. But, but it actually wasn't because the sky is so full of amazing things that you don't miss trees. And there are hundreds of species of grass with roots that go down a mile. So it's its own rich place. Most people who aren't born there think it's boring mm -hmm. and there's nothing to see and, and they drive through on the Trans-Canada Highway. But, but for me, it, it's where I go back to um, when, I, when I think of a seminal place. Um, I wrote a number of poems that were based on Old Testament stories, and they took place in Saskatchewan for me. When, when God said, let there be light, it was Saskatchewan light that <laughs> happened. And, and I think that there's a reason that I, I, I can say that without feeling any embarrassment. Eudora Welty said every story would be a different story if it happened somewhere else. And I sincerely believe that for the kind of writing I do, which is very place-centric, where I come from matters greatly to what I write and the way I see the world, what narratives I choose to explain who I am and what the world means to me. So what drew you to the rainforest? A job. <laughs> I got asked to apply for a job at the University of Victoria. And at that point, my partner, who's also a poet, Patrick Lane, had lived 15 years off our poetic wits. And that's about as long as you can do it. Uh, we applied for grants, writers in residencies. You don't sell many poetry books. Mm. Movies don't get made of your books. So one of us had to get a real job. And uh, that turned out to be me for 24 years. I taught in the writing department. So we went there for that reason. I actually wept when I left Saskatoon. Mm -hmm. 
And when people said, where are you moving to? And I said, Victoria. No one felt sorry for me, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I get that now. It's a place I don't want to leave anymore. I think when, you're, when you, you know, apparently our cells reproduce every seven years. Jeff probably knows this sure. as a fact. <laughs> anyway, I don't know that I can go back to those long, brutal winters anymore. So, because you're um, not the same person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I'll stay on, on the West Coast, and it's become my home. And, of course, home is also where your lover is, where your husband is, where your cats are, where your yes. garden is, and, and that's now the West Coast for me. And so what about the Fiji Islands? Do they shape uh, you? Well, actually, I came to place in the sense that you're talking of relatively late because my parents were in the Peace Corps, and we did uh, yeah. spend five years in Fiji, and I spent basically from when I was four until I was nine there, but we also traveled a lot besides that. Uh, so we were never really rooted to one place for very long, and I think one reason that I turned to fantasy and speculative fiction is because I had all these places in my head that I had visited or lived in but did not feel a part of. Mm -hmm. And so I had amazing experiences in Fiji, but even very early on as a child, it felt kind of appropriative to write directly about the place. Um, so, for example, one thing that reappears in my fiction is a night when our family was walking along the side of the reef, basically, at night. Uh, my dad was doing research on something. He was a research chemist, or is. And um, I got separated from my family, and uh, I, my flashlight went out, and I couldn't tell where I was, and I didn't know which way to walk because I didn't know which way the shore was from the sea because it was pitch black and it was mm. a cloudy night. And I came across this kind of phosphorescent starfish after a while that didn't necessarily let me know which way was the shore, but it kind of calmed me because it looked literally like a compass. Um, and it calmed me enough to wait until my parents caught up with me. And so I had these kind of formative experiences that I wouldn't have had if I'd been in the US of uh, just being completely out in nature and completely at times lost. And those are the types of things that went into my fiction early on, are those individual experiences. Then when I moved to Florida, and I've been in Florida since I was in middle school, um, I gradually grew to really love North Florida and to do a lot of hiking in the wilderness there. And then what you're talking about, mm -hmm. a real sense of place, a real sense of belonging, um, and a real sense of loving these transitional landscapes because there's this really unique landscape there where it goes from pine forests to like black water cypress swamps to salt marshes and then out to the sea and it's really really, really a unique uh, environment and uh, that just kind of solidified what I'd already learned in terms of a love of nature from from Fiji but then also this additional personal element uh, and that first came out uh, in the Southern Reach series where every every description of setting in those books is from first-hand experience uh, and I thought that was so incredibly important for something that was going to talk a little bit about climate change and talk about our environment, that it not be secondhand, that it be lived in. Uh, and of course, the, the focal point for that in terms of climate change and, and our environment was when the Gulf oil spill came along. And for a while there, they didn't know that they were going to be able to cap it. And so for all of us on the Gulf Coast, there was this swirl in our heads of the oil continually 24-7. We couldn't sleep, we couldn't eat, we couldn't think about anything but this thing that was now kind of in our minds and we couldn't get it out. Uh, and so that just kind of solidified also the idea of um, contributing to local activism uh, and, and trying to preserve this amazing place that was under threat. I wasn't originally uh, gonna ask you about Florida Man because I can imagine <laughs> it gets annoying as someone from Florida to be asked about Florida Man the same way that Canadians are always asked about how much they say A when they go well, places. Uh, but then I noticed uh, you made a prediction <laughs> that in for uh, 2016 that all two, 20 million, 20 million Florida residents would combine into one, into f one great one Florida, Florida man, Florida man, yeah, I, and I take over that. every other state. The, uh, I'm sure there's an Oklahoma <laughs> man, you just don't hear from him quite as frequently for some <laughs> reason. Um, I think there is something about the fact that, you know, I talk about those transitional environments, well, the whole state is full of all these different micro environments <laughs> and micro societies, and it's almost like 12 or 13 or 14 different states in one, and then when you have such an influx of population coming in on top of that, and a lot of corrupt politics uh, and, and other things on top. It, it's un, it, it, you're just going to have shenanigans wherever you look, I think. Is there some like essential weirdness 
<laughs> well, I mean, there is also still this ever-present uh, wilderness, you know, even in South Florida, although North Florida is, is much more unspoiled. Um, and I think that, that contributes to it because you're still, in some cases, kind of living in the wild. I'm a great fan of Carl Heiss. And oh, yes. And, <laughs> and even as crazy as he gets, he's still he, he's, fairly It's still reality, accurate, right? Fairly yeah. accurate. Yeah. But I was also going to say that um, slowly into the Southern Reach uh, books crept British Columbia and Vancouver Island because we were visiting it so much and I was falling in love with it so much yeah. that some of the details of like uh, Botanical or Botany Bay yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, but Botany, Botany Bay, Bay yeah. Uh, yeah. are rather pivotal to parts of the second oh, and third book. So that things got a little muddled. <laughs> Thank, thankfully, I never named it as Florida, so, so I can yeah. get away with it. But. Hmm. So we're here to talk about ecofiction, um, but artists tend not to wake up and say, I'm going to write a book of ecofiction today. <laughs> um, you know, genres tend to be applied retro retroactively to uh, writers and other kinds of artists and can sometimes sort of either, they can, they can create communities in a positive sense and also group people together strangely in ways that feel uncomfortable to them. Um, I'm also, my, my partner's a musician, and <laughs> he, one of his first albums, everyone was like, oh, great Chill Wave album. And he's like, I don't even know what Chill Wave is. Yeah. So I, I, I have firsthand experience of uh, what that can be like. So I'm, I'm curious to know what you think about that genre. Um, Jeff, I know you've, you've written interestingly about uh, uh, sort of the, the desire to label mm. being a sort of <coughs> part of the same uh, human gaze and des desire to territorialize mm -hmm. and, you know, this factionalism that we tend to fall prey to. So I'm, I'm curious what you think that genre means and whether you feel as though you're a part of it. Um, I like that term more than some other terms. There's a term, uh, cli-fi, um, <laughs> that I don't particularly, <laughs> not particularly fond of. Um, and, um, and, 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 and there are terms that are more commodifiable. And what you find even in book culture is when you start talking about like even genres that have been established for a while, you wind up talking about marketing and you don't wind, you're not talking about the actual content and what's going on. And so I try to be as slippery as possible in general in terms of being labeled as any one thing. The weird label I don't mind, the eco-fiction I don't mind um, because they, they do encapsulate things that I'm trying to do, but you're right, you don't set out to write eco-fiction. You, for example, have a deep connection to a place and you feel it's threatened. Um, your dad's a scientist and, and you see his studies and, and you see the studies of his colleagues and that gets you thinking about certain issues related to, that are useful in terms of fictional narratives. Um, so, so I like some labels. There's another label, um, and it's too much to get into now, but you can Google it, um, hyperobject, which has a long definition, um, but has to do with something that manifests both locally and more widely um, and seems at times uncanny and is hard to grasp in one place that describes uh, climate change. And you're never going to find a weird section of the bookstore or a hyperobject section, so I, I like terms like that. Um, but I, I do think it reflects a going, growing awareness by the public. I was skeptical of the actual effect of ecosystem, uh, ecofiction for a long time because, you know, we've had Margaret Atwood and J.G. Ballard and, and others come along and have very potent uh, visions in this regard and it hasn't seemed to necessarily change things. But I do know that I get emails from readers who find that suddenly it's rendered more immediate in the laboratory of fiction. And so someone who might think, climate change isn't going to affect my life, it might affect my grandchildren's life, suddenly has an urgency. I don't think it affects a global, cha a global climate, uh, a climate change denier, necessarily, because that's its own special cult. But I think you can bring an immediacy to it, mm. and you can kind of, in that laboratory, do experiments that are useful in terms of thinking about these problems. So where does ecofiction, how does it relate to some science fiction? Mm. Well, I mean, you could call it a subset of science fiction, but I, I rebel at that because writers like Ben Lerner uh, and even Joy Williams uh, address these issues uh, in mainstream literary fiction. Poets are dealing with this, this in, their fiction, in, in, their, in their poetry. And so I think, uh, you know, using the broadest term possible is the, of the most use because I don't think science fiction writers have a particular claim to this territory especially as the kind of science fictional future, future is bleeding into our present every day as we're seeing in the news. Uh, and for that reason, I see a lot of uh, mainstream uh, uh, contemporary novelists dealing with these issues. And it might not be like in a post-apocalyptic landscape where they're going off on some, 
quest to save the world. It's just simply it's, in, it's invading people's lives. Mm. Uh, and I think that's potent too. And I think that really can hit home uh, for a lot of people and not be didactic because it's just part of the landscape. Mm -hmm. Lorna, you, I think you said that The Wild in You was the first uh, book you had put out that was explicitly about the natural world all the way mm. through. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you consider yourself an eco-poet? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think all my life I've been a poet that has used images from nature. And in a way, for a while, that was very uh, considered very outre, old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we kept hearing that, well, the real poets are writing about the urban, hip, cool world. And suddenly now it's popular, and I'm an eco-poet, whereas <laughs> before I was a boring, you know, middle-aged nature poet. So I'll, I'll take any label, I guess, that, yeah. that you want to give me. We've been called me. worse. We've both been called worse, probably. Yes, yeah, so it's, oh, without, so. without a doubt. Um, <laughs> the Wild in You book was, was a, an interesting experience for me because it wasn't my idea initially. Um, uh, a woman who is the editor of an online travel magazine called Took and Canoe. I, I hope you look at that when you go home. It's, she's trying to show Canada to Canadians and get us all interested in our own country. Anyway, she uh, sent me to the Great Bear Rainforest to write a travel piece, and she said, while you're there, maybe you could meet my friend Ian, the famous natural wildlife photographer. He's won prizes with National Geographic, etc. And I said, well, yeah, okay. And she said, maybe you and he could do a book together. And I thought, what is she talking about? You know, I, I write poetry out of a, a long, sustained relationship with a place or an idea or a story. I just don't, you know, become a tourist poet. And I'm sure Ian felt the same way because he didn't even read poetry. He admitted to me that his mother and his wife knew who I was and had read my work, but he didn't. And uh, so when we met, we were, we were very cautious. We, we kind of circled each other like strange wolves, not trusting each other. But we found that we, we really liked hanging around. And uh, he loved seeing my, my absolute stupefied wonder when I saw a grizzly bear from here to that wall. Oh, wow. And he was taking photographs. And I was, oh my god, this is my first bear in the wild. And when I saw orcas and when I saw humpback whales, again, just a, a few feet of whale away, and not because we were whale watching, which I disagree with, but because we were just traveling by boat on the ocean and stopped the boat to look at the whales. So uh, we had a connection. And he said, why don't I send you some photographs and let's see what happened. So he, what will happen, he sent me some photographs and I was inspired by having been there and by my love forever of the natural world mm -hmm. uh, to write a series of poems. And they, in some ways, had a purpose. We wanted to get the book out before the decision was made about Northern Gateway. And I think most of you know that Northern Gateway was the oil tankers that were going to ship bitumen through the Great Bear Rainforest to Asia. And there would have been so many tankers a day going through those sacred waters. And there would have been bound to have been a spill. And it's rough, wild water. If bitumen spills, you can't soak it up. You can't soak up oil. But bitumen is even worse. So Ian and I thought, you know, if the book can have any kind of influence, it might gather opinion against that and might pressure our government. Now, Justin Trudeau just said there will be no oil traffic in, in the Great Bear Rainforest. He nixed Northern Gateway. I'm not saying it's because of the book. I wouldn't be arrogant <laughs> enough to say that. But that has happened, and kudos to him. At the same time, he approved another pipeline, which is going to take more tankers out of Burnaby across the ocean. And again, we're going to have a, a similar problem. So he got it 50% right. But in, in a sense, I wanted to write poems more than I ever had in my life that I hoped would change politics, would have some kind of effect. But again, as you said, you have to do it where you're not being didactic or polemical. You just have to try to create in the reader a sense of wonder and astonishment about the natural world and hope that might plant a small seed that will lead to some kind of positive action for the environment. So that's where I was an eco-poet at my uh, most obvious, I guess, and flexing my muscles a little bit. <laughs> 
Well, that actually leads nicely into the, the second half of the title of this talk, which is about climate activism. Um, you know, activism is a very sp specific word. It describes a very specific thing. Do you see a place for poetry and activism and a place for activism and poetry? Do you consider that to be activism or do you, uh, is your job different? Yeah, um, I'd like to think that poetry takes on an activist role, but um, I think more modestly, what poetry does is it doesn't allow us to dwell in abstractions. Mm -hmm. It battles against every abstraction you can think of and puts a human face on those big words like poverty, racism, desecration of the environment, you know, um, abuse, uh, misogyny, and, and it tries to find a way to particularize those big words that frankly mean nothing to us anymore. And I think that's the job of poetry, to take us to the individual and the, and the specific and, and to let those nestle inside of us. Mm -hmm. Instead of me saying, for instance, we must love the earth. You know, here's, here's a small image from a poem. Um, on the side of the gravel road, the dust is so fine, though the frog is lighter than a leaf. You can see its tracks. That's what's missing in heaven. So I hope, like the, the great haiku masters, and I would never assume I come anywhere close to their power, but by giving you an image like that, um, the poem can take you to a sense of, this is what I love and must value and hold holy. And these other big statements maybe belong to politicians or brochure writers, or another kind of rhetoric that poetry, in a way, works against. And poetry is also probably the only literary genre, genre that is completely outside of the marketplace. Mm. You're never going to make money from poetry. <laughs> you never write to sell a book. No poet I know has an agent, unless they also write novels and nonfiction. So we are completely non-commodified. Um, and I think there's something to be said for that, too. It's perhaps the wildest of genres, the one we can least box in, hem in, make work for anything other than what it's meant to do. And that's to take us to, I think, a place of song and a place of holiness and a place of wonder. And maybe that's an activist role. I think you said something like, in another interview, you said something like, uh, that you, you would lay down your body in front of the tankers, but instead you'll lay down your words. Yeah, <laughs> and big deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the book is not going to stop a tanker or my words, but it's what I do best, so that's what I, what I have mm -hmm. to try to do. Jeff, I have a sort of a different question about activism um, and, and your work. And so I was, I was thinking about this in two ways, one in terms of inputs and one in terms of outputs. So in terms of inputs, you know, when I read um, parts of, for example, in Bourne, when you read, read about the, the, these, these little tiny red salamanders mm -hmm. raining down yeah. um, from the sky, I thought, wow, I wonder if he has a clipping of horrible ecological disasters, <laughs> or uh, sorry, a folder of news clippings of horrible ecological disasters from around the world, or is that purely from your imagination? I'm curious mm -hmm. whether, well, I'm sure, your, I'm sure your imagination comes into it no matter what, but to what extent do you draw from real life ecological crises when you, mm -hmm. when you, when you paint specific scenes? Well, I, I have a particular bent towards research, which is that I don't want it affecting me when I'm writing the novel. So I tend to do research four to five years mm -hmm. before I start on a novel and then just kind of let it kind of uh, permeate. <laughs> do you also kind of try to forget about it? When I try to forget on, about yeah. it. I figure if it's important, <laughs> I'll remember it at the point where I need it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, so the serious point there is that just not in the same way, but to a small extent, uh, 
like anyone who studies for science climate change, you can get situational depression really quickly. <laughs> um, so, uh, so there's that. There's, there's this massive amount of research that just kind of organically comes out later. Um, but I'm also a big believer in the subconscious when it comes to writing. So I don't want that to overwhelm anything. The, the salamanders I actually stole with permission from a writer named uh, Elizabeth Hand, although they weren't falling from the sky like drops of rain and dissolving into the soil in, in her book. Um, so, so I think it's also not necessarily ecological disasters, but also the life cycles of animals. Mm -hmm. I study a lot of uh, what people used to think of as out there biology. I was particularly fascinated by squid and fungus because they're the organisms that seem most on this planet to be almost alien to begin with. And they have very fascinating life cycles and habits. And so if you can if you can study those and find a way to bring them into your fiction mm. organically, uh, you can create something unique, uh, p potentially. Uh, and so all the biotech in Bourne, uh, all the animals and whatnot, kind of just came out of my imagination, but there's probably some research in there at some point. Uh, but you know, if you read a contemporary novel, they don't, uh, a writer, you know, something set in the modern day, uh, the present, they're not going to sit there and give you six pages about how a, a, a smartphone works, right? You really wouldn't want that, would you? <laughs> well, in a novel that's set in a ruined future city, I don't think you want six pages of description of how the biotech works. It just is there. And so that's part and parcel of absorbing the research is I don't want it to show. It's almost like a historical novelist doesn't want to be was, doesn't want to have the tell of showing how much research they did. If, if they're good, you, you, you almost don't want to notice that. So. But it sounds like the natural world can be uncanny enough. You don't, you don't need to go to the you know, crazy world. Well, when I, when I hike out at St. Mark's, it could be very uncanny. The first time that I saw a dolphin in a freshwater mm -hmm. canal, I didn't realize that dolphins came up during the high tide and that they could function to eat fish and that. So, so you have these uncanny moments like seeing the line of a dolphin and the fin slowly coming visible in the canal and your brain literally running through all the options thinking otter, fish, whatever, but not <laughs> dolphin, not dolphin. Um, <laughs> and the similar situation when we first visited Australia because I'm used to a flash of brown meaning a deer and out pops a kangaroo and your brain like literally freezes for like 15 <laughs> seconds while it adjusts. And so there are those moments, there are those genuinely uncanny moments when you see something out of the corner of your eye that moves away and your brain has said <laughs> it's something it can't possibly be <laughs> and you really don't want to see it again anyway if, it, if, if you do turn, but it's gone. <laughs> and so that's the space for your imagination to come in and work. And then there are those moments where you're just overcome with something beyond you in the world. And for me, it always comes through nature. And, and you know, I was out there hiking once during a thunderstorm and again, got completely lost. And getting lost in this world is very hard mm. and something that I highly recommend, like getting <laughs> truly lost because it's not a sensation a lot of us have. And, uh, and just it being this tran transcendent moment, being surrounded by lightning strikes in this, 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 this very wilderness area, um, perhaps the most the, the, the thing that manifests the most, and this does apply to the fiction, uh, we'll, we'll end the story quickly, but um, I did once encounter a Florida panther on a trail oh about two God. in the afternoon, which is a very atypical time to see anything unusual. Um, and I'd already hiked 14 miles and there was no way I was gonna run away from the thing anyway. Uh, and so I experienced another moment that's very unusual, especially in the natural world, is of being completely out of, con having no control whatsoever. Uh, and the thing was either going to eat me or maul me or it wasn't and I had nothing to do with that decision There was nothing I could do at all except for stand there and these are the kinds of moments you channel the emotion of into your fiction so there's no mm. there's no um, Encounter with a panther in the Southern Reach trilogy. There's just simply an acceptance. I think the transference of that emotion um, into issues related to climate change and individuals trying to face this thing where they have no control um, so that's research too. Um, jumping over alligators is research, um, all, all that kind of thing. <laughs> do, you, do you purposely go out of your way to travel a lot to try to get, get into those situations? Yes, I really, I really prefer to be mauled, almost killed for my <laughs> research. But, um, no, it's more that in, in Florida, you're likely, if you're hiking to see alligators, you may have to jump over one if, if it's across a trail where there's water on both sides and you've been hiking for a while. Um, they're like, they're just scaly basset hounds, basically. They're, 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 they're nothing to be worried about. But. Is there a particular animal that you have a, a connection with? 
I, uh, from reading this, the the thank yous at the end of Born, it seemed like bears are bears are your jam. Bears <laughs> right now are my jam. I mean, it's funny because the the guy you teamed up with on that book, yeah, Ian a book McAllister, did a book about bears that was central to my research. That's great. Along with a book called Bear Attacks, which I highly recommend if you <laughs> like horror stories. Um, <laughs> but there's something about their ferocity, their tenacity, the fact that they're such a huge animal, and even though they're an omnivore, they're still a predator that's existed and to some degree, if not flourished, held their own in the modern era when a lot of other animals haven't, um, that I find quite fascinating. I also have a huge monster cat, uh, kind of a Maine Coon cat, that has these huge shoulders and used to <laughs> jump down on me from the mantle while I was sleeping. Um, which is not good for a middle-aged man, but this huge 20-pound <laughs> cat, and very bear-like. Um, and so I had that physicality to also... Um, there's a lot of research, a lot of research that goes into this. It's just sleeping and being involves, awakened yeah, by your cat. Yeah, um, having your so, cat sleep on it. Yeah. I was very charmed, <laughs> very charmed to see that you thanked your cat. <laughs> well, he's Not very much page. responsible for a lot of the, 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 the characteristics of the giant bear in, um, in Born. <laughs> So you were mentioning that you sometimes get emails from readers thanking you for making climate change feel specific to them. It, is that um, a happy accident of your writing, or is there some action that you set out hoping for when you write those books? No, I, I you know, you were talking about how it has to be organic and mm -hmm. it has to be lived in, and that's exactly how it is for me. I mean, I don't go out there thinking; it's just that these are the issues that are on my mind, and they come out naturally. Um, but I do, when I have a rough draft, and I think, you know, how can I do this so I can put this opinion in this person's mouth? Yeah. And this, you know, do, do it, not change it up, change it up so it's a little bit different than you might expect. So there's, there's people that aren't particularly agreeable saying things that I agree with, and then the people who you might not expect saying the things I agree with. Um, and then you usually do that later in the novel so that in, in, only where it's necessary, where they have, are gonna have those conversations anyway. And, and you hope that, that if they're about climate change, that they're not didactic, that they're in the, the, the moment, but that they might make someone uh, think twice about it. Uh, but these emails are very sincere, and I'm very much a curmudgeon, so at first I didn't believe this was happening. I was like, are these <laughs> books actually having this effect? I, I'm really not sure, but, um, but yeah, I get a lot of people um, sincerely saying that it's been of use to them, uh, so, so I guess it must be. Do you have to work hard to get that um, didactic tone out of Places where where climate change will come up in a you know in a in a conversation. Between well, your the characters. first book in that trilogy, Annihilation, the biologist, the kind of joke behind the surface, to me at least, is she has no interest in human affairs whatsoever. So she just catalogs what she sees in nature and summarizes human conversations. So there, it's very easy not to be didactic. In the second book, you have somebody who's trying to direct this whole secret agency that's exploring this weird phenomenon that's occurred. Uh, and so he has to have these initial conversations with people. And I think the, clue, the, the, the thing there is, is that I've channeled a lot of my own conversations as a contractor dealing with government in the US. Um, and those are some of the most absurd interactions that you can possibly imagine. <laughs> um, so you get an element of absurdity in there. You get an element of tension. You kind of, you, you kind of destabilize the scenes in a weird way. Um, authority is really a novel about people having conversations in corridors and parking lots and never actually getting to the meetings that they're supposed to go to. Um, so, so there's things you can do from a technique uh, point of view in terms of the scenes that, that can, can make it not didactic and hopefully entertaining. Uh, but you still have to stay true to whatever your character point of view is. So at a certain point, that's what's guiding mm -hmm. you. So when it comes to nonfiction, there can be, there's this critique out there that uh, we shouldn't depress people too much because it stifles action. And uh, you know, there was a, a, a big long piece in the Atlantic that just came out about climate change, and um, you know, shared all over my social media feeds. But then there there was the inevitable backlash of people saying it was too dark, and that you know, if if you're too dark and too depressing, then uh, people feel hopeless and they won't act. Do, Lorna, do you, do you agree that, I mean, this is sort of outside the purview of, of fiction. Um, do you agree that, you know, that, that we shouldn't depress people? Or if the truth is truly depressing, should we give everyone the unvarnished truth? This is a very selfish question, by the way. I, I write about climate change all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I don't understand why we're not all rolling around on the floor screaming uh, in great despair about what's happening. Um, I remember a few years ago, two years ago, I think, uh, 
you might be more aware of the date cake because you're a journalist. The Manchester Guardian editor was resigning, um, retiring, and he said he'd made one mistake in his journalistic life, and that was not to write enough about climate change. So the last year of his life, he was going to have nothing but that in the newspaper, and he was not going to call it climate change. He was going to call it what it was, climate catastrophe. So I think as, as writers, I mean, whether that's our bailiwick or not, it has to be. If we're not writing about the diminishment of species on our planet, and therefore the diminishment of our own species, then what the hell are we seeing? What the, what, how we numbed our hearts and our sensitivities not to make that part of whatever we're writing about. Even if we're writing something set in you know, uh, a city where there, there are nothing but parks and no wilderness, surely we have to say something about that. Greg was mentioning the great climate catastrophe that's going on right now, the floods in Texas. I live in BC right now. There have never been worse wildfires in the history of that mm -hmm. province. I live in a rainforest. We haven't had rain for three months. So not only is there smoke coming into the place I live on Vancouver Island, where there aren't many fires but being blown in from the interior, there's also dust everywhere on all the great trees in the rainforest, and there should not be. Um, how can one not approach that in literature and in life? And I think there is a real danger that many people, including me, sometimes just feel numbed by this, uh, and because we don't know what to do. But what poetry does is it helps us grieve, and it helps us mourn, because it takes us back to those primal emotions always. And I think we have to grieve and we have to mourn what's happening, but then we have to get the spark, get something ignited that will lead us into that spark of hope and possible action. And uh, I, I feel very strongly that that's got to be in literature, that we can't turn our faces away. Bertolt Brecht has this poem which wasn't about climate change, but which I think of all the time. And I, I might not get it absolutely right, but it's, uh, in the dark times, can there be singing? Yes, there can be singing about the dark. And that, I think, is my, my, my goal, my uh, necessity is to do that in poetry, is to sing about this dark and to hopefully do it in a way where I and people who read literature and poetry can find the next step. I love Wendell Berry and uh, uh, an environmentalist, a farmer, a poet, and he said, we can't worry about whether what we're doing is going to succeed whether it's going to be successful, because if we worry about that, we're not going to do anything. What we have to do is take the step that we know is right for the earth, what that step is going to be. And whether it's done in the context of your yard, your back garden. My husband and I live across the road from about five acres of a, a second or third growth forest that leads down to the beach. And it's a park, a park of municipal jurisdiction. And it's infested with English ivy. And uh, Patrick, my husband, started going out there with his secateurs, mm. ivy off these magnificent trees. And he got me going. So now we have clipped ivy off about five acres of trees. <laughs> And it's a hell of a job. It like it's it. dirty. It's aphid infested. We've both fallen. He rolled down a ravine. <laughs> and I'm surprised in crack a rib. He came home cut by blackberry vines and other thorns. But by God, we're getting rid of that ivy off those trees. And that's a small thing I can do that is freeing trees from suffocation. Mm 
So I think we all need to find that small thing and we can't pretend that what's going on isn't going on or we're just buying into the doom. Climate change seems like the hyper object par excellence, the, <laughs> the, the too big to grapple with in its you know, entirety but manifests itself locally in ways that are, uh, you know. Well, that, that, that uh, the one I saw was a New York, uh, art, a New York Magazine article uh, that was doom and gloom. It might have been the same one as the Oh, Atlantic, sorry, I think but, you're right. I think it was a New um, York magazine. But I, that, that, that was a good example of what you're talking about with regard to hyperobject because I thought half the people who lost their bleep over that um, <laughs> were being very territorial because they were people who actually do lecture circuits where they take the middle approach. So someone just coming out and showing the worst case scenario was making them lose their own ability to not scream about the situation and compartmentalize it and make it safe for themselves. Um, some of them were pointing out actual factual errors, which the article uh, uh, writer actually calmly then corrected and everything else. Uh, but in actual fact, you saw again this defending of territories. Um, mm -hmm. This idea of it can't be this way in part because I believe that, in part because also I'm actually lecturing about this, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I can't, and, and it kind of goes against my own livelihood, which is kind of disturbing. Um, so there's that, um, and then like you said, there's this thing where we don't seem to live in the moment enough. Uh, my daughter is a sustainability consultant who works with the World Wildlife Fund, and she still says yeah, the top things you can do are drive less, eat less meat, all of the things that seem simple, but things that you can do uh, to make the situation better, at least not worse, but also in the moment, like you said. I mean, I've spent a lot of time since the election putting up bird feeders and feeding mm -hmm. birds in our yard, and it seems like a small thing, and, you know, and creating a greenway that a better greenway for animals to pass through uh, in terms of our yard. And that may seem like a small thing, but we have to remember that we too are in the moment. Um, it's not like any of us are immortal. Um, and so we have to cherish the moment even more and more in these times and try to make it something that is something of succor and, and of um, acts of loving kindness as much as possible. Mm -hmm.